hanging off paper scissors for our students. This is an excerpt from my novel, um, Splitting the Wind. When I'm with Javier, and he runs his hands from the base of my spine up the two halves of my back to cup my shoulders, when he traces the scars where my wings used to be, when he kisses me with his eyes and his mouth, I believe it. But after I leave him, alone in my cold bed on the third floor of the house I share with the other wingless laborers, Staring at the faded mauve flowers of the wallpaper, the voice in my head tells me I'm childish and naive, that he couldn't possibly love this body. The next time I go to the saloon, he'll have a different woman on his arm, one with feathers, one he can flaunt. I've seen the way they swoon over him. They practically line up to talk to him. I'll approach him, tentative, eager, trying not to be obvious, and he'll say hello, then turn his back to his companion with a dismissive nod at me. And there will be my heart wrapped in my secret dreams, smashed on the floor like a festival glass, trampled upon by feet too drunk to walk straight, shards ground into the wood until I can't scrape any of it back up. I'll be trying to lick the mess up when everyone's gone, crawling on the ground where I belong. It was all just a cruel joke, a passing fancy, and I was stupid enough to fall for it, and my wingless sisters will all tell me so and spit when anyone says his name. I've touched him for the last time, think my hands, as I lie in bed and touch myself the way he touched me, but it doesn't feel the same as his hands, which I will never hold again, says the voice in my head. No, yes, you know you're only being used. No, just this once, let it be for real. It's not. Yes, it is, it's not. I steel myself against impending heartbreak Every time I climb the rope ladder into the saloon, I ready my eyes for him turning away from me. I command my hands not to shake. I hold myself on the rope with one hand while I push open the trap door near the bar and cautiously raise my head. I don't dare look up to find him, not yet, not until I'm standing. Then a hand appears and grabs mine, and I look up, startled, into Javier's smile and dark eyes. He pulls me to my feet, hugging me with arms and wings. Around us, people pretend not to have seen. Can I get you a drink, he asks, leading me to the band's table. The percussionist kindly vacates a stool for me. I nod, afraid to speak. I know what people are thinking when they pretend not to notice us. If we don't not acknowledge it, it doesn't exist. At most, she's a dalliance for the traveling musician. No harm done. It'll make the poor girl's life. Best thing that'll ever happen to her, probably. I watch Javier at the bar getting me a bourbon. Angela, who can have any man she wants, whenever she wants, glances at me quite deliberately before she brushes Javier's arm with her wingtip and says something witty. He laughs politely and excuses himself with a glance at me. Angela meets my eyes again and smiles big, then spreads her wings, rises effortlessly into the air, and zips out over the dance pit. My heart sinks deep into polluted ground. I hardly notice as Javier gives me the bourbon and gets up to play. I might as well give up now because Angela never will. Though it's been over two years, it feels like yesterday when she looks at me and smiles like that. It's the same smile she gave me the last time I ever talked to Gavin Combs right here in the saloon, and I know exactly what it means. My heart sinks lower remembering Gavin he was a few years older than we were, and he was quiet, clever. I never really noticed him that much, and then suddenly I did. It was around the time the council agreed that we wingless girls were old enough to come to the saloon, that we deserved at least to hear the traveling musicians and drink some of the bourbon that came in from Monroe. It was awkward at first. Even those who meant well didn't really know what to say to us. Most people pretended we weren't there. Angela and the other pretty girls clustered in one quarter and giggled, glancing at us across the room. But little by little, enough people started talking to us. Chet Carter, Sheriff Lincoln and his son Brad, Cindy, Rosa, Val and Jim, Gavin, Midge the bartender, that we felt welcome enough at the saloon. I didn't notice until Jenny mentioned it that Gavin and I often found ourselves deep in conversation on the sidelines of whatever group was assembled. It was true, I realized, 
and felt deeply ashamed, I did gravitate to Gavin because he was serious and intelligent and talked about interesting things, and his hair and his wings were a lovely shade of russet. But I knew that nothing more than talking at the saloon was possible. It hadn't even occurred to me to think about anything more. He was winged, and I couldn't imagine it occurring to Gavin. What if he thought I had intentions? The idea was humiliating. But after that, I noticed that he sought me out as much as I did him. I was terrified but exhilarated. Something I had not allowed myself to consider because it was forbidden was suddenly both possible and appealing. Then Angela set her sights on Gavin and told me as much with that broad, cruel smile one night at the saloon. She fluttered over to him as he stood at the bar, and then her blonde feathers were all over him, tickling his arms, brushing casually against his wings. She kept giggling, and before long, he was flushed and laughing, unable to look away from her. My throat closed as I watched her lead him out over the dance pit. They began whirling together in the air, swooping round one another, touching wingtips, clasping and releasing their hands, smiling into each other's eyes. After that, Gavin was with Angela, and he didn't come over to talk with us anymore. I turned my anger on myself because Gavin hadn't done anything wrong. Angela was exactly the woman he was supposed to want. I could see the wonder and amazement on his face when he looked at her. He was a man who never thought he'd be that lucky. He had never looked at me that way, and he never would have. I hated Angela, but I hated myself more for being a fool. A year ago, Gavin died of influenza. The whole village heard Angela screaming. She acts like it doesn't still hurt, but she looks at me with so much hatred behind that smile that I can tell her heart is still charred by grief. I can tell she wants to make me hurt as badly as she does. Javier's voice snaps me out of my reverie. He has begun to sing, and my body wakes up and starts tingling. I look up, and he isn't looking anywhere near Angela, who preens by the bar. He is looking straight at me. There is passion in his eyes. And suddenly, a big knot of anger and hatred that I've directed at myself chrysalises, whirls in upon itself, and somehow transforms, grows flaming wings, and becomes passion directed at the man who is singing for me alone in the crowded saloon. I don't want to hurt myself anymore, but I realized that I would fight with my entire body for Javier. The next time Angela meets my eyes across the room, I smile broadly and stare her down. Yeah.